Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome John Waters back to Los Angeles. Just a few years ago, just a few years ago, uh, in the Library Foundation's Allowed Authors series, we had the honor and tremendous fun of celebrating the publication of his book, Role Models. Welcome as well to Jeff Koons. We all know his body of work and the extraordinary acclaim which he has uh, won throughout the world. But this evening is different. Tonight we get to know the man. My name is Ken Brecker. I'm the president of the Library Foundation of Los Angeles. And we're co-presenting this evening with our newest neighbor on Grand Avenue, the Broad. The Los Angeles Public Library has been on Grand Avenue at Fifth and Flower for longer than you may realize. If truth be told, before there were newspapers in Los Angeles, before we had paved roads, before there was electricity in Los Angeles, there was the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm, I'm very happy, I'm very happy to report that under the leadership of a great city librarian, John Zabo, a man who loves art and architecture and who is here this evening, our public libraries are flourishing. It may just be, it may just be that the 21st century will be a new golden age for libraries as well as museums. The public libraries are filled with people, artists, writers, students, and people of all ages and all backgrounds from every community. Everyone is reading. Hardcover books are not going away, but since Gutenberg, technology may be the best thing that ever happened to libraries. People are using the public libraries thousands of free computers to learn more, to find new opportunities, to write and to create. Did you know that you can now check out an ebook from home and not have to worry about late fines because it disappears from the device when the loan period is over? If you're wondering why the Broad is presenting this evening with the Library Foundation, the reason may be that the public libraries are the greatest resource for arts and culture in the city of Los Angeles. We have over four million photographs in our collection, and we circulate more art books and films than any cultural institution. Whether you are going into our branches in San Pedro or Echo Park, the Pacific Palisades or South Central, from downtown across the San Fernando Valley. We are open seven days a week and we are free. <laughs> the Broad is helping us to usher in this new dawn and we look forward with great excitement to how together we will transform Grand Avenue, downtown, and perhaps Los Angeles as a whole into our country's most creative and progressive and generous city. And it is now with great pleasure I introduce Joanne Heiler, director and chief curator of the Broad Art Foundation and the founding director of the Broad, Joanne. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, welcome to the beautiful Orpheum Theater for this evening's conversation. Part of the Unprivate Collection series of talks with artists produced by The Broad. We're still about a year away from opening The Broad, a new contemporary art museum for Los Angeles. We're under construction less than a mile from here. But we're very, very anxious to share a glimpse of what is to come when we do open our doors with events like tonight. When a contemporary art collection is built, you have a rare opportunity to know the artist as you discover their work. Conversations with artists are a big part of what drew Eli and Edie to collect, and they are also what inspired tonight's talk and the entire Unprivate Collection talk series. They're a way for us to introduce the museum and the collection uh, to you. This talk, the fifth in our series, brings together Jeff Koons, an iconic American filmmaker, author,
performer and artist, John Waters. <laughs> I take it there's an interest in these two figures. <laughs> um, but still, some have asked me why we brought them together to share a stage. Jeff Koons is one of the most well-known artists in the Broad collections, and the Broad Museum will hold his work in unparalleled depth. 33 examples and counting. Some of Jeff's works feature whimsical objects, balloon animals, cartoon characters, inflatable lobsters. And so we thought, who better to pair with him than someone who's also famous for flaunting conventions, to put it mildly, with great wit and intellectually wide lens. Jeff and John have both been cultural light lightning rods for decades now. Jeff has been called the King of Kitsch, and John has had even more monikers. The Pope of Trash, the Sultan of Sleaze, and the Baron of Bad Taste. But in my view, they don't really upend standards of good taste. They each, in their own way, ignore the notion of taste into non-existence. And so, with that in common, we knew that pairing Jeff with John had all the ingredients of a delicious evening filled with, as John might say, shameless integrity. You're in for a treat tonight, maybe even a historic evening, as we present two creative visionaries sharing their unique views of art. Please welcome Jeff Koons and John Waters. Wow, that was, that was a very presidential debate entrance, wasn't it? <laughs> it was great, John. It was great. Um, I'd kind of like to start at the beginning and ask you a very Freudian question. Um, did you have a secret art life as a child? <laughs> uh, John, when I think in about the very beginning for me, it would have started around the age of three. And uh, I have a sister, I have a sibling, Karen. And uh, Karen's three years older, and she could always do everything better than me. She could count higher and uh, pronounce words better. She could do everything. But around three, I remember drawing uh, at a desk and my parents coming up behind me and really kind of patting me on the back and saying, you know, that's fantastic, Jeff. And I finally felt that I could do something better than my sister. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a sense of self. And finally, I kind of had a position in the family. I had something that I could bring, you know, kind of to the table. And that's where it began for me. And, and, uh, and what were you drawing? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that it was probably like a, uh, a sailfish jumping out of the water. In our local newspapers, they would have um, every Sunday a column called Cappy Dick. Mm -hmm. And Cappy Dick was a sea captain, and they would have these activities for children, and you were to uh, extend that activity. So maybe uh, it would be, you know, a boat, and somebody sitting uh, fishing in a boat, and then you would color that in and uh, cut it out of the newspaper, and then glue it down on a piece of paper and enlarge the scene. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I could have been drawing a sailfish jumping out of the water. And so I would end the, enter these contests. I never won first prize which was an set of encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. But every week I would, get, uh, I would get the second prize or the third prize. Was this prize. the How to Draw, that one guy that had the ads, you too can be an artist? Yeah, yeah. Remember him? Well, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I, I would do those drawings too. I enjoyed uh, making those drawings. But that's how it started for me. And it, I started taking uh, lessons on weekends uh, when I was seven, eight years old. Every Saturday I would, you know, be taking an art lesson, whether it was from a, really an, an elderly woman, I'd be down in her basement and we'd be drawing vases of flowers every... But you every never Sunday. drew anything that caused alarm to your parents? Uh, no. I would say that I had, you know, behavior. I had a little wild side when I was uh, younger and uh, I would get in trouble a little bit. But uh, art was something that I was always pulled to but I had no idea what it was. And I think in some manner, 
it created anxiety because I didn't, I didn't know what this activity could be. And there were a lot of rules, you know, you uh, try to make something look really three-dimensional and very lifelike. And, you know, I was good at that because I had lessons and, you know, I knew how to use light and shading and color. But it didn't seem to answer a question of its own being, like, why exist, you know? Yeah. But you were ambitious when you were a kid. Um, I think I started to become ambitious when I heard Led Zeppelin. <laughs> and, uh, no, but really, uh, I, when I heard Led Zeppelin, it was kind of a changing moment for me in my life. All of a sudden... Not uh, art. Uh, no. No, it had been... I, I, I learned, my father taught me aesthetics, so, you know, I learned that uh, aesthetics, colors, and textures can affect the way that you feel. Mm -hmm. But I also learned a lot about feeling through Zeppelin, and, uh, and, and it ties to, uh, you know, sociology, and that, you know, I wanted more. So I remember, you know, uh, being 16, driving around in my car, listening to Zeppelin and, and wanting more, you know, deciding that, okay, you know, I want to get out of here. Uh, <laughs> I want to follow, uh, you know, the things that I'm thinking about. And my friends at the time would kind of think, oh, you know, Jeff, what's he, what's he thinking about, these philosophical things, you know? And so I started to become, I would say, somewhat more isolated because I wanted, uh, I wanted more. But what was the first artwork that you ever hung on your wall? Even if cut out of a magazine or anything. Uh, whew, that I hung on my wall. Yeah. Uh, I remember my aunt, uh, uh, my Aunt Erna. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't on my wall, but I remember doing a, a drawing of a, of a woman, and uh, she had a kind of a, a, a hat on her head and a, a scarf around her neck, and it was a straw hat and a, kind of a ribbon coming around holding it. Uh, holding it on her head, and I always remembered that, and mm -hmm. I'd, I framed it up and I gave it to her one time. Uh, I was probably, I would say at the time, maybe eight. You know? But you never felt alienated by art. I mean, I remember when I first went to the Baltimore Museum and bought a little Miro print and brought it home. All the other kids said, oh, that's ugly. Why would you put that ugly thing on your wall? I thought, ah, oh, the power of art. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it, it really yeah. made me feel glad that everyone yeah. hated it. Yeah. And as a kid, I used to pretend I was nude descending the staircase, and no one knew. I would come down the steps yeah. thinking, uh, uh, moving, you know, only I knew. Yeah. So that's what I that's great. That's meant by a secret art life. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I, didn't, I did not have the, uh, the upbringing of going to museums. Uh, you know, my, my aunt that I mentioned before uh, lived in Philadelphia, and she took me to the Philadelphia Museum. And uh, so she was the first that kind of uh, showed me kind of a, an urban kind of life, in a way, mm -hmm. uh, cultural institutions. And it's funny that you mentioned the Baltimore Museum, because uh, I ended up, you know, going to art class all the time in school, and I wasn't really prepared to do anything other than go to art school and be an artist. Uh, so I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art, and the first day they took us to the Baltimore Museum. And uh, they put us on a bus, we went there, and when I went into the museum, I realized I did not know anybody. I didn't know who Matisse was, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know Cezanne. Uh, I really, I would have known Picasso, and I would have known Dali, but that would have been about it. And I feel like I survived that moment. And I, I feel that, you know, a, a lot of people don't survive that moment. But somehow I got through that moment. And I ended up, uh, you know, getting back on the bus, going mm -hmm. back to uh, uh, school and having an art history class. And the teacher brought up an image of Manet's Olympia. And he started to talk about uh, the different images and the different uh, symbols that are taking place in the painting. The cat over on the... Uh, uh, the right-hand side, or the bouquet of flowers. And I have to say, I felt like the luckiest person in the room because I felt like, finally, there was a reason for being, that uh, you could, I could be connected. 
how you know art can connect you to all the human disciplines. I could be involved in philosophy that I love. I could be involved with sociology and uh, aspects of theology and like every aesthetics and everything just came together and finally I understood that art was something that instead of creating anxiety was something that removes anxiety. Well, you were in 1972 at Maryland Institute and I was making pink flamingos in Baltimore at the exact same time. <laughs> and we never met, yeah. we never met. Yeah. But were you rebelling then? Uh, yes, I mean rebelling in that you know, I wanted to find my own way in life, and I was interested in transgressive things because I was interested in parameters and 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 feelings and uh, sensations and how they become ideas. Uh, so I was interested in kind of self-discovery, the the work that I liked. I enjoyed surrealism, Dada, and all of the, and I enjoyed your work, John. I mean, I was following uh, uh, your films. But I was interested in things that I believe were uh, helping me learn to trust in myself, an inward journey, and to develop a sense of personal iconography and a, a language that uh, I could start to create to affect my own feelings, my own sensations, and then eventually to you know, be able to do that and affect others. You know? Well, you know, they always bring up taste when they're talking about you. We, they always mention good taste and bad taste. And uh, I was drilled in good taste by my family, and that's, I turned it into a career, rebelling from it. But, but at the same time, you have to know the rules of good taste, um, and I think your work is in good taste. But if we look at one here, the mirror one, that particular one, there was a furniture store in Baltimore called Stanley's. Did you ever go there? Uh, no, but I'm, I'm familiar. I went outside it. It and was I looked on in Utah the Street. Me too. Sure. It, yeah. we, tried, we couldn't afford it, but we wanted to make it what pink flamingos look like, the inside. And that mirror, I mean, it, Stanley's, I always wondered, did he go shopping there? Because <laughs> it, it was a store that was beyond taste. Mm -hmm. And I think, <laughs> I think both of us, never make fun of what we're referencing. I don't think we ever look down and say, yeah. this is kitsch, this is bad taste. I think we look up to it yeah. because it's a freedom yeah. um, of a certain kind of extreme taste. And I mean, and, and you took that mirror and, and took it from that and t put it in the, completely turned it around in the same way, but I always thought that you respected that mirror. Yeah. You weren't asking us to look at that mirror and make fun of it in any way. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. You know. I, and I think we do share, uh, and this is really kind of the heart of our, our work, I think we really do share a core. And uh, that core, I think, is acceptance. And I remember uh, when I was young, my grandfather and grandmother, uh, they had a table kind of similar to this uh, in their little library and where they also had the television. And uh, they had a little porcelain uh, figurine. It was a, a woman lying down. Uh, and she was on a couch, and her legs were up in the air, and it was actually an ashtray. And you're supposed to be able to put your cigarette there. <laughs> and, and, and if you put your cigarette there, the smoke uh, was supposed to have the legs go back and forth. But you would, you would really push it back and forth. But, you know, as a, a young child, I enjoyed that. She was quite sensual, yeah. and uh, it was kind of sexy. And I'm sure that I was kind of a little aroused in some way. Again, this sensation of feeling, feeling the sense of porcelain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that's very important. And I think that experience of enjoying that little ashtray and playing with it, and you know, every time we go to my grandparents' house, running over as soon as I get in the yeah. door, <laughs> to, to play with that ashtray, it's, it, uh, that work is as wonderful in its own being as the Pieta. And I can receive, as a, and I did receive as, um, as much enjoyment in observing that and interacting than I do you know, with the Pieta today. So uh, for me, it's about acceptance. And it's, it's about accepting the self and first really accepting the self. But then after you accept the self, you automatically want to go outward and you want to go into the world, and you want to interact, and you want to increase your parameter. And so you start to work with metaphor, in, uh, with objects, and accepting 
objects, accepting things for that may be a little bright or economically may be manufactured in a way that an upper class may not be so attracted to it. And in accepting these things, it's all metaphor for accepting of others. I agree with that. Do you, do you agree with this statement, that I think your work is never funny? I think it is fun, but that's an insult to most artists, but I pay it with great compliments, and always witty. Would you agree with that? Uh, I think that it's optimistic, and uh, I, I think I try to put a, a good kind of foot forward in embracing life and I enjoy life's energy, but I like feelings, and so I like things that feel uh, kind of vast and kind of exciting and, uh, you know, yeah, a sense of future. Uh. Can we go to slide number five? Because I'm wondering, okay, you're at, you're at the Institute in Baltimore. You're doing, how did we get from there to this? Uh, you know, I have to say... Because I love this yeah, work. I mean, I, this I work really, is I, like, I, it stops you in your tracks. Yeah, I, I, and you feel stupid at first, and then you get smarter by the second as you look at it. Yeah, that's great. That, that, I have to say that's really very uh, it's sweet, John. It's great. But I really love this work. And so, I, you know, I was in art school. I was always a, a painter, and, uh, and I would win awards for my drawing and my painting. I went to Maryland Institute College of Art. The president of the school gave me a show in his office, and, uh, you know, I, I won a scholarship to Skowhegan, and I, I didn't go to Skowhegan. I ended up going to Chicago instead to study with the uh, Chicago images. But... Uh, and I, and I studied there, and I, I was always painting, and eventually my paintings uh, became so kind of large that I had to take them off the wall. And so I started, and that had me go from being a painter to kind of doing a lot with sculpture. And I also wanted to stop making work that was about uh, uh, more of subjective aspect of what I dreamt the night before. Or I really wanted my work to be more objective. And I, th I was looking at work of Robert Smithson, of uh, uh, Robert Morris, uh, uh, a lot of Leo Castelli artists. And so I, I moved to New York. This would have been uh, 19, end of 76, 77. I started to uh, have this change take place. And the rabbit's from 78. Mm -hmm. And are you, does it matter to you if viewers are confused or angered by your work? You know, uh, John, the art happens inside the viewer, and I, I really would like, to, you know, you would like to be able to communicate the sensation I get when I look at this piece. I mean, I feel something. I feel kind of a sexual stimulation, and that, that, that stimulation... I'm liberal. Yeah, but that... Uh, but uh, that, that stimulation turns into idea, and so, you know, that's, you know, that's... The way the body responds in uh, your heartbeat and uh, the d sweating, the different things that the body does respond uh, responding to stimuli really depends on the context of how you feel, the different uh, type of emotions that you feel. I was very excited about the openness of this and the, uh, the energy, and I felt that it was being objective, that it was going into more of an archetypal uh, vocabulary. So it was not innocence to you, this? Uh, uh, aspects of it, but also there's, a, for me, a kind of a sophistication that there are parallel dialogues going on. I mean, the, the carrot to the mouth is like an orator, like I'm speaking right now, microphone, uh, but it also kind of a symbol of masturbation, the carrot. Uh, so, in other words, it's not your devotion to innocence is <laughs> colored, right? I mean, it's, I mean, you seem guiltless in the devotion to innocence. Would you agree with that? Uh, guiltless in the devotion of it. Well, I, I'm inter I mean, I'm interested in youth in how open we are and how really kind of unjudgmental we can be, that we can, you know, you love blue for blue and pink, you know, pink. And, you know, you can uh, you grab an inflatable and, you know, you, you want that to be yours. Uh, I just want to mention, John, one of the reasons that the inflatable is so important to me is, uh, you know, we're inflatables. You take a breath... You know, you're inflatable. And so uh, they're really a kind of a symbol of, uh, of optimism, you know. But, but can cute, I mean, some people think that, is that threatening to you, cute? 
the word cute is a word that I basically yeah. don't like, and you probably don't either. Yeah. Um, I mean, you don't like it if somebody says your work is cute, you know. So, and that's the, maybe the biggest insult you can give. I don't know. But, um, but is it threatening? When you do it, sometimes it's almost threatening to me. You know, what I believe I was starting to play with is affirmation. And so the mirrors behind the rabbit and behind the flower, they are affirming you because you're, it's totally dependent on you. The art needs you. When you move, the abstraction changes, the reflection changes. And so it's affirming the existence of the viewer and that everything's happening inside them. These things are just very stimulating, but the art's inside them. But, but childhood is a huge, you have six children, you, childhood is very important, I think, in your work, but is menace always lurking near childhood? I have a total of eight children. You have uh, eight? Total. Okay. I have six young ones right now. But uh, I would say <laughs> what's, uh, what's menacing for me is to uh, not exercise uh, freedom, you know, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, waste, to waste an opportunity. And we all have this opportunity every moment of our lives to exercise uh, the freedom that we have to really experience enlightenment, to experience the vastness of the possibilities of what our experience of life can be and the revelation of those possibilities to ourselves. Well, I mean, let's look at the one, uh, the uh, number 13, the caterpillar in the ladder. Um, to me, that's threatening. I don't know. Everybody knows you don't walk under a ladder. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, John mentioned the nude descending the staircase, but that was my nude descending the staircase. <laughs> well, I can see that, yeah. yeah. But, but, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I'm always wondering if underneath there lurking is the danger of childhood. Okay. And, um, of course, it is dangerous to have a child. Anything can happen. But so, so when you look at this work, is uh, like number 12, that's another one. To me... That's scary. That reminds me of a playroom in a prison when you visit people. <laughs> and they always look in this other room where the children are supposed to play when they're visiting their parents and have a life sentence. It's a joyless place. <laughs> and I always look in that little room and no one's in there. No children or anything. And so maybe... Can you look at your work and like it in the wrong way? <laughs> Maybe I have. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, absolutely. The, the, the way you view something, I mean, it, it's, it's perfect. And everybody, what, whatever experiences you have in life, your interpretations of something, your experience, the art that you're feeling, that's perfect. And uh, uh, that's what you should experience. That's about your parameters and uh, your expansion, uh, John. I would say that when I made those works, and I had objects going through other objects. Uh, for me, I was going through a moment in my life where I had one of my uh, children abducted, a yep. parental abduction, and I was trying to get them back, and I felt that I was experiencing uh, kind of a, a sense of injustice. And I used my art to get through uh, this type period. So it happened during celebration, and uh, also it's still going on uh, during my uh, Popeye series. So it was about going through things in life, but not having it deter your course and to be able to kind of maintain your same course. Those objects are exactly 50% kind of uh, inside the uh, chain link fence. Mm -hmm. And they, they function a little bit like Rorschach's too, the inside of where the, you know, the inside of the hippo where you have those two holes is kind of like a pelvis area. And the same with up in the, the uh, turtle. Um, can we look at number nine? Um, the word new, I think, has always been very important to you. Do you feel pressure to still always be new, like the vacuum cleaners inside those cases? Uh, the new, for me, um, came about, I wanted to add to, you know, hopefully I wanted to contribute to kind of the Duchampian history of the ready-made. And I was working at the Museum of Modern Art, and I was visiting the architectural design department all the time, and you know, studying a lot of films on Dada. And, and uh, so I decided that to show kind of a very ephemeral, kind of ethereal aspect uh, of these objects, their newness, uh, to try to uh, bring that forth and make it kind of visual. And so I started to encase them, and I would remove them uh, from um, their environment. 
And these are vacuum cleaners. So again, they're uh, anthropomorphic for human beings. They're breathing machines, and they have kind of sexual orifices. So it's to relate to kind of the the tension that we have between inanimate objects of uh, who's really better prepared to survive, whether it's an inanimate object that can just display its integrity of birth, or if it's a biological aspect that we develop our integrity through interactions. Well, as I said before, sometimes your work, when you first saw those vacuum cleaners, a lot of people were struck dumb by it. They didn't know how to, to take it. But then, once they thought about it, you made them feel new, too, I think, which I think <laughs> is very important. But is new, is it tinged with nostalgia? The new that you were celebrating there? I, I know that the new started to... I, I felt that the way people were responding uh, to it uh, maybe looked at it a little bit in kind of the 50s, of, uh, mm -hmm. the, maybe the housewife in the 50s. And I, I go on and I create a series after the new called Equilibrium that I thought was more of a masculine view of maybe consumerism. It used more sports uh, colors and objects. And it actually turned out to be even more biological, uh, like an equilibrium tank where a basketball is just kind of hovering in the tank. Uh, it's, fair, it's like... Uh, an embryo in the womb. Uh, it's, it's there and all forces are equal and it's just hovering, but it's very biological. And, and sex is, you're talking about sex in your work a lot that maybe people wouldn't have immediately seen it. Is sex art power? Uh, yeah, it's, it's feeling and it's, uh, it's sensation, it's pleasurable, and it, it helps communicate ideas. I mean, uh, uh, body, the human body responding to situations, uh, turn, you know, creates ideas. I remember when I went to the Maid in Heaven show in so Soho, and I went through it, and it was like a rock star show. There were lines all the way down Broadway. It was amazing. First time I'd ever really seen that in an art show. And some of the work in there was absolutely amazing, but yet you've destroyed some of it, correct? I was in a... Uh, custody uh, case. So I, I, my ex-wife was kind of trying to bring the work to the level of basically pornography in the eyes of the court. And I was trying to uh, gain custody of my son. So my artist proofs I destroyed. But, you know, I enjoy the work. I, I, I love my, uh, the paintings. I love Manet. I love uh, Glass Dildo. Ilona's Asshole is kind of my, kind of my Corbet origins of the world. <laughs> But uh, so I, I really uh, I enjoy the work. I think uh, pieces like Bourgeois Bust, uh, in a kind of very romantic way, kind of show you know the underlying kind of theme of kind of love and, and the broke and the, the different tensions of the eternal, of uh, the different ways of entering into the realm of the eternal. You have the biological uh, realm. You have the realm of ideas uh, playing off kind of the more traditional realm that's uh, presented by. Uh, uh, religions, you know. So if we could look at 19 at the big balloon dog. Now, is this sexual? Because basically the dog's neutered. Uh, uh, I mean, the only way it's going to reproduce is on a plate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a limited edition one. Yeah. But, you know, I look at the tail and uh, I always think the tail's kind of a symbol of male energy. And I've also always thought that the, the balloon dog, it's a little bit like a Trojan horse, you know, uh, and it's, uh, it reminds me of another type of Trojan, too, mm -hmm. that you could uh, yeah. use to make the balloon dog. But, uh, no, I, I think of it as quite kind of masculine in a way, uh, kind of male energy. You know? But it's cleaned up. I mean, this dog can't ship. You know, <laughs> nobody's going to follow it around with a newspaper bag, yeah. you know. Uh, it, it can't have sex. It's, it's neutered in a way, in, in a great way. So is it manufactured perfection? Uh, you know, uh, John, Which would be good. Yeah, I but I, I sh when I said that it, it's masculine, I think the front of it, I think that the nose kind of has a masculine aspect in the tail. But if you look at the legs, the legs are very feminine. And uh, it's really feminine form. So uh, it's still prepared to have sex. So well, <laughs> well, let's look at a sexual one, number three. Um, so this one, you know, really, I'm against people riding dolphins. Get your lard ass <laughs> off those things in your bullshit spirituality, you know? However, <laughs> how do you feel about that? <laughs> uh, I w I, well, the, uh, 
the inflatables. Whenever I would uh, visit my mother, my mother lives in uh, Florida, usually I would come home with an artwork. And uh, whether it be I would see like a lobster inflatable or uh, seeing a dolphin uh, inflatable. But uh, to me, when I made an image like this, this is a painting, uh, it was like uh, creating kind of a contemporary uh, Aphrodite mm -hmm. and uh, uh, riding a dolphin. And, uh, and then the, the Popeyes in the background also kind of remind me of my father's generation of, uh, of uh, the way of kind of viewing the world and aspect of power and also the power of art, the transformation uh, that art can bring about just like you know, Popeye's spinach brings about that mm -hmm. transformation. And let's look at 18, which to me is your scariest work. And um, one that, <laughs> does Bubbles know the truth? <laughs> uh. <laughs> A jury thought one way, does yeah. Bubbles know differently? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that third arm. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, uh, actually, the, the one leg is kind of buried underneath the, uh, uh, there's like a blanket there. But uh, the, this piece always reminds me a little bit of King Tut. And uh, there's aspect of uh, the Egyptian, uh, even the way that Michael's in the gold and the white and the way he would put the, had his eyes tattooed. But there's Egyptian quality. And even if you look, it's a little bit like the pyramids of uh, Giza where you have like the line in his leg right there and then you have bubbles and then you have Michael on his arm. And it, so it's making reference to King Tut and the monuments of Egypt. But then also this is the Pieta. And uh, it's having a reference uh, with the Pieta. Well, you talked about power a little bit. Well, Mr. Broad has your rabbit in his home. That's power, right? I mean, are you comfortable with that, with the power you have? Because you wear it well. Uh, where I grew up in Pennsylvania, at, you know, different times of the year, people really enjoy celebrating the holidays. So at Easter, a lot of people will put inflatable rabbits out in their yards. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I started to work with ready-made objects, and this would have been back in the 1977, 78, uh, you know, the rabbit's one of the first images. The Broad uh, has uh, my first one, the inflatable that we looked at with the flowers, the first uh, inflatable rabbit. And uh, the Broad also has uh, this rabbit. But uh, when I, I would look at it, um, it reminds me of as I mentioned before, like an orator or a playboy bunny or um, you think of resurrection. Uh, there's many different ways you can view it. And I think that's what kind of gives it kind of an iconic type of, uh, of power in that it can have a lot of different uh, meanings to different people, but it affirms everyone. Anybody looking at it, it first is affirming you. It's telling you that you exist, you're important, everything that's happening here is happening inside you. Well, I always look at it and feel shameless integrity <laughs> when, when I see it, which, which is power. And this is, why do you think this piece is so iconic of all the work you've done? Why do you think if somebody had to pick one piece, they'd probably pick this one, the most widely known. Why do you think that is? Um, you know, there are a lot of different reasons that go into these things. Uh, media goes into it, uh, different articles that uh, took place. I mean it's based on some of my very early inflatables uh, that I worked with and because of the, again the many different readings that people can look at it and have it, uh, it can have a lot of different meanings and the celebrity aspect when you talked about you know whether you like it or not you are a celebrity and they say that you're the heir to Warhol how do you feel about that compliment which people give you a lot uh, I'm always honored. I mean, yeah. first of all, Andy is an amazing artist, and uh, I've always just wanted to participate. So uh, from the time when I was telling you before, like, uh, you know, uh, at three, I wanted to participate in my family, you know. At seven, in the, you know, whoever I was taking lessons with, and, then, you know, I wanted to participate with the avant-garde. So I've always have wanted to participate. Uh, I would like to... Uh, exercise the freedom that I have as an artist. That's what I want to do every day. So it's just uh, the, the meanings of whether I'm associated with Andy or not, 
it really ends up to be meaningless. It's about what I do in my studio and to what potential I uh, live my art, you know, my artistic life, my life to. And so you are a brand, you have to admit, whether you like it or not. But can too much of that attention, you know, is the fact that your price, the prices are so high for your work, is, can people look at your work fresh now with that in the news all the time of how much artwork goes for and record-breaking prices and everything? Does that make it harder to feel new? Um, you know, I have to say, John, I prefer it that way than... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but, uh, I, I get it. Yeah, no, but uh, but I think I think that you know <laughs> it, it, you know I try to always make things and to make the work accessible. You know, and one of the reasons uh, of being here uh, this evening is the uh, you know helping support the Broad, which is helping. You know, these works are very very uh, public. Uh, it's a private collection, but it's open to the public, so people are interacting with it. I um, enjoy being here to talk about the work, and I try to make things that are, are accessible. I mean, it's about ideas, and you know, you look at it, and if you get it, you carry it with you for the rest of your life. It's about a, a philosophy, you know, it's about acceptance, and it's about not making judgments, and about having everything work in your favor instead of alienating things from you and alienating all the possibility to have everything in play and that you can use it and work with it, uh, it's about that. And that's uh, it's, it's an idea. And there's no value. Actually, I feel a little sorry sometimes for Eli and Needy because they take on the responsibility of taking care of these things. You know, collecting is a responsibility. And it, it costs a lot of money, it costs a lot of dedication to take care of things. Uh, when you know the public is able to just get the idea and uh, they don't always have to take on that responsibility of caring, protecting and hoping you know to try to share it uh, with others. Do you think you could ever work small again? I do. You know I, I just had I made a gazing ball show. Uh, that's another reason I think that people enjoy the rabbit that was just there because the head is really a gazing ball. Let's do the gazing ball number 14. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, you got it up here, sorry. Okay, uh, so uh, this is a gazing ball piece. And, uh, but the, so the ball that's on Hercules' uh, shoulders, the Fernese Hercules, uh, that's the same as the head of the rabbit. Uh, and you know, people know from just in the back of their mind that they've seen them in people's gardens. They've seen it in very accessible places. So the work is always telling you about the accessibility that everything's accessible, everything's here. It's all at your fingertips. Just open yourself uh, to it. Well, the gazing ball is the first shot in Pink Flamingos, too. They were always uh, right next to a Pink Flamingo in a lawn, a gazing ball. Yeah, yeah. So when I saw that, I thought we were in the same. You know, it's a funny story, but Jeff's Fantastic. aunt and my mom, who unfortunately they both just died very recently, were in a very fancy retirement community together. And they would sit and gossip. You think that's bad? You should have been at the Made in Heaven show. Yeah, I was at the female trouble opening. They would trade stories about what it was like. And I thought that was so great. And they were like, ha, 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 you know. But <laughs> they would just trade horror stories of when we were young and being startled by our work. <laughs> they love to play bridge together. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, if, this if this we was, could... by the way, the aunt that took me to my first museum. Oh, she Miami was, yeah. 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 Well, my parents supported, too. Like, I wanted to go to junkyards as a child, and my parents would take me to <laughs> junkyards, and I'd walk around like a little ghoul, say, there's been a terrible accident here. <laughs> and my parents would allow that, yeah. you know, and they, because they didn't know what else to do. It didn't say what to do in the baby book, you know. Yeah. If your child is obsessed by car accidents, what do you do? <laughs> so... <laughs> We both had good parents yeah. that encouraged yeah. us, right. Um, but now, I, I must admit I was perplexed by your, your crudes thing for the Disney, the full page thing that you wrote about it. I was surprised by that. You did startle me. Um, was that part of your art career? Uh, no, it wasn't. Well, I would say that was part of uh, my appreciation of things. So, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberger and... Uh, uh, Harvey Weinstein uh, thought that it would be interesting that if I would see the film. Mm -hmm. And I saw the film, and I was with my family, and I thought that it was great. So I wrote uh, 
you know, uh, Jeffrey a letter and just telling him what I enjoyed about the film. And I enjoyed how it was giving people uh, uh, insight into Plato's uh, philosophy. And it was, you know, based in enlightenment and of, uh, you know, being in the cave and freeing oneself from the cave and uh, going into the light, into enlightenment. But did you know it was going to be a full-page ad uh, in the New York no, Times? No, no, well, they no, asked you, right? No, no well, after the, they asked me later, after the fact, and I said... After so. they published it? No, no, <laughs> but after I wrote the letter. Oh, uh-huh, right. Um, and how did the Lady Gaga thing happen? Uh, you know, uh, Lady Gaga, uh, I met her maybe about, I would say, five years ago. She performed at the Metropolitan Museum, and afterwards I was with Mucha Prada at a table, and she came up and she was talking to Mucha, and I... It was introduced to her, and, uh, you know, she just grabbed me, gave me a big hug. It was fantastic. And uh, she was telling me that she was such a fan that she used to smoke a lot of pot in Central Park and just talk to her friends about my work. And, uh, and so that's great. But then uh, she ended up, uh, you know, when she uh, got involved with Art Pop, she contacted me later and asked if I would do the album cover. And I have to say, she's a wonderful woman, really creative person and has a great heart, really loves her public and loves communicating and trying to, you know, share ideas of art and uh, of empowerment with, uh, with her fans and with people. And um, are, you, are you a collector today? Uh, you know, the only thing I know is art. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, I love art and uh, I, I interact with art that's really from a different kind of generation. It lets me kind of feel to be in contact with other artists and kind of this other kind of family, an extended family. So uh, so I collect some things. Yeah. And back to Lady Gaga, do you smoke pot? No. <laughs> you never I mean, did? No. I, I mean, of course, I tried things, you know. Did you try LSD? Uh, well, you know. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. I know you got kids, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I was younger and I was a wild kid. And I, I ended up more than uh, those type things. I drank beer. I drank a lot mm-hmm. of beer. But, uh, Were you ever arrested? Uh, no. For, well, drinking beer, no. I was once. At the yeah. Carlin's drive-in. Yeah. It was really embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can we look at number 10? Um, so... I think it's, you know, some people say, oh, well, his staff does some of the work and everything. Well, so what, it seems to me. I mean, but if you think it up, is it conceptual art? Well, you know, I mean, I, I believe that I do everything. Now, I, I work with a lot of people, and it's, uh, it's, I started working with a foundry. And when you cast things, every artist, go to a foundry. You bring an object, a model. They take it from you. They'll put it into a wax. You come back. You will um, make improvements to things, and they'll put it in metal. You come back, and you'll say, can you do this or that? So there's a sense that it's leaving your control, but yet you're controlling it from a distance. So when I started with my first bronzes, I had that experience. But when you create systems of control, it's like you know articulating your finger, like if your mind, you know, you want to pick up a brush and you want to take it here and sweep it around with a little orange here and then go like this and then pick up a little white and blend it in between. It's really no different than doing that with somebody else in that if you create the system where they know exactly where that swirls to be and right here and exactly how that's to blend. So it's a way I wanted distance because I was scared in my, uh, more of my youth, uh, in my past, of uh, being too physically involved. I came from a very Duchampian background that I felt that if I was physically involved and if I wanted to create a swan, I could start off to create a swan but end up creating a pig or a duck. And uh, by having the distance, I could always stay in control that it's a swan and that it would be exactly the way I wanted. Now, I have to say that I've in life, and a lot through the understanding of Picasso's work, I've kind of come full circle, and my whole idea of the objective has really changed. And uh, it's like the yin and the yang, and it's a complete full circle. And so whether you are physically involved or not physically in, uh, involved, it's a full circle. Um, if we can look at number two. So I, I understand how when I'm thinking up a movie or writing a book, how the ideas begin. How did that begin? How do you first say, okay, what is the very first time you, day you thought what this is going to be? How did that start? Uh, 
Anthony Dufay, an art dealer in London, every year would ask me to make a calendar for him. And make a, what? a calendar uh -huh. for his gallery. And he would send out a, a calendar every year to his clients. And I was showing with Anthony, and every year I would never get around to doing it. So he really pressured me uh, one year, and I said, okay, I'll do it. So uh, I, I uh, got a very large camera, format camera, and I started photographing uh, objects. And so I made these uh, balloon tulips and put them on mylar backgrounds and, and photographed it. And uh, I created a painting out of that. I ended up creating uh, the sculpture uh, based on uh, that So this photograph. was a painting first? Well, it, the images, I, I was started off making a calendar. My whole mm -hmm. celebration series was really uh, laid out as a calendar. And I realized, wait a minute, this is too good. I have a whole body of work here. And uh, so uh, Anthony never got his calendar. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so, the, you know, tulips are, it's like an underlying of spring, or my hanging heart's a little bit like Valentine's Day, or there's aspect of romance. It could also be something tied to more of a theological aspect, or, you know, they're, uh, they're different images. Uh, bread with egg could be something maybe around Easter or maybe another uh, time of the year, depending on uh, someone's uh, background. But so there's this aspect of a cyclical year that's taking place. And positive, I mean, I have not heard you say a negative word tonight, which is very rare for an artist, to hear an artist talk about anything without anything being said negative. So should we believe you? <laughs> um, I think that I did speak negative. And when I, when I spoke negative was when I spoke about uh, un- uh, kind of exercised freedom, of not exercising one's freedom. To me, that, that's, uh, you know, you, that's kind of like showing uh, a dark side. That's what you, you don't want to do, that you want to exercise that freedom. And uh, so uh, I'm always, you know, trying to wake up each day and kind of pinch myself to try to, to do that, not to go into the dark. Can we look at number six? So. The party hat. Now, this is one, you know, a very optimistic piece, it feels. But when I look at it, I always wonder who deserves to wear this hat. You know, are children <laughs> always in danger? You know, I guess I'm thinking negative sometimes. And, and, and only because I'm saying it's so cheerful that it hurts almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, that, that hat, my son Ludwig, uh, he was, uh, this was a half year birthday little uh, party I had for him at home. He was 18 months and he wore that hat and he was abducted the next day. Oh, yeah. so I'm right. Yeah. There is something yeah. scary about yeah, this but, picture. Well, there's, there's, uh, but it's, uh, you know, trying to grab a hold of something. I had to maintain a, a faith in humanity. And I, I had to just, and through my art, I was able to maintain that to constantly uh, believe in uh, humanity when I was really uh, losing, you know, uh, my trust in humanity. Well, I understand that. I mean, because without the outlet I had in all my movies, all the antisocial acts, if I had done them all, I would have gotten the death penalty. So, so <laughs> we basically, what would have happened yeah. if you didn't have success? Yeah. What do you yeah. think, do you, if you had to have had another career, let's say this mm -hmm. didn't work, mm -hmm. and something has to work to be a certain age to still do it, what would you have done? Uh, you know, John, I was brought up uh, by my parents and my grandparents to be very self-reliant. So really from a young age, I would go door to door. I'd sell gift wrapping paper. I would sell chocolates. Uh, you know, I worked after school as a busboy. I worked at gas stations pumping gas. So, uh, you know, I, always, I enjoyed, first of all, taking care of myself. Well, those are all salesman jobs. Well, I mean, not pumping gas. No, not pumping gas. And not uh, bus boying. Except uh, you're in L.A. working but, in that one gas station. But, but I think that those, uh, I think that sales is really interesting because it's the front line of morality. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wait a minute, say that again. It's the front line of morality. Sales is? Sales, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, That's but, a pull quote. No, yeah. but... but and, and I enjoyed it so much because as a child, I would go and you'd ring somebody's doorbell and you never knew who would open that door. You didn't know what they were going to look like. You didn't know what odor was going to come out of the home. 
I had a job once doing Gallup surveys, going door to door, but no one would ever let me in the house. They'd open the door and slam it in my face because I looked so crazy. So I made them all up. And it took an hour to do each interview. So that was my character development. You know, I had to be a housewife. Every day I had to do six and seven of them. It's great. And that was the only job I ever had, really. So that's you were great. successful at it. They wouldn't let me in. No, that's great. Well, yeah. you were no, you were successful at it too. I mean, no, they well, I mean, a different way. I use it. Way. Did you ever see that characters. movie, Door to Door Maniac, with yeah. Johnny Cash? Yeah, yeah. It's an obscure one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's look at number four. Yeah. So, what was your religious? Um, did you you weren't Catholic, mm. were you? No. no. Yeah. When I was younger, I was brought up uh, Lutheran, mm -hmm. but my parents really uh, didn't uh, participate that much. So occasionally, we would go to church on you know, on holidays like Easter or uh, Christmas sometimes, but uh, we weren't uh, strict or really involved deeply. So you really say that there is no irony in your work, right? Well, in a, uh, John, in a piece like this, I was trying to show the way uh, the church has used different materials, uh, different, uh, the way it's used art, and also the way kings and uh, monarchs and uh, how art's been used. and. Uh, uh, and that now, you know, they, a lot of things have become completely democratized, and the materials have become democratized. Uh, porcelain uh, came right from the king's kitchen. This is made out of porcelain. And I was trying to, in the body of work banality, uh, let people know that whatever they respond to, it's perfect. It's fantastic. You know, if you respond to a pig, you know, great. If you respond to a penguin, fantastic. It doesn't matter. If you love banal images, if I'd have a watermelon on my head right now, balancing it and playing a trombone, if that's what you like, great. And it's about not feeling in, inferior to, uh, to culture or to, to taste and that accepting your own history and that the history is perfect. Everything's about this moment forward. And as soon as you accept yourself, then you can start to have transcendence outward. Because you look, of course, I look at it so perversely. I look at this symbol. That's what the Manson family did, one in Charlie. You know, and I know that you didn't have that in mind. But, but, but people can read all sorts of things in that. But don't you encourage that, really? With well, yeah. I mean, I'm making reference to uh, Leonardo's uh, St. John. And Leonardo, oh, there's also another artist that Leonardo uh, was referencing. So there are a lot of references that are taking place, but uh, yeah, there, the interpretations, uh, you know, they, you have to have a lot of different interpretations uh, looking at something like that. So I'm not trying to uh, control that completely. I think I'm trying to control certain sensations, certain uh, uh, the way the body responds a little bit to it. I would like kind of a, a certain things to happen, so there's a sense of idea happening. I, I loved when you did the show in Versailles. I thought that was the perfect matching. Mm -hmm. And was that for you like a dream come true to be able to go through Versailles yeah. and put work yeah. in there? It was great. Um, I had a friend, and I still have a friend, uh, Jerome de Dormont uh, in Paris. And he's a gallery dealer. And he would always say, you know, Jeff, you should show at Versailles. And I would say, oh, yeah, sure, great, you know, let's do it. And, uh, and but, uh, you know, he was able to speak to people, and before we knew it, some of our friends were in positions where it was able to happen. And uh, it was fantastic. And I uh, made the choices for the exhibition, what I showed very intuitively. And uh, it, it really felt like being the, you know, the court artist uh, mm -hmm. during the exhibition. And I know that you still have a farm that's not that far from Baltimore, and you go back there some. Have you seen the housing development of garden apartments in Baltimore called Versailles? There really is one. It's staggering. Wow. It's staggering. Wow. Wow. It has the big sign, Versailles, and it's like <laughs> one bedroom unit garden apartments. <laughs> You've got to go see it. Yeah. It's really yeah. great. Yeah. Be great. Uh, yeah. um, do you, let's look at uh, number seven. So, in a way, no, not number seven. You know, uh, yeah, one, one. John, one so thing can I just... Do you feel there's ugly, ever, is anything in yeah. your work ugly? Yeah. I don't feel that yeah. you feel that. Yeah. You know, I just want to jump back, if I okay. can, just for a second, about Versailles. And it's uh, Louis XIV, Louis XIV. You know, Versailles was this meeting place where everybody was welcome. You know, you could enter the halls of Versailles 24 hours a day 
I mean, everybody was welcome. They brought things from all over the world, any new exotic thing or ideas or everything. It was absolute place of collection of ideas and openness. And that's really what I loved about Versailles and interacting in that environment and, that, uh, and connecting to you know, uh, this time. And this is where ideas really blossom from. So. OK, so back to ugly. Mm -hmm. Is there anything ugly in your work? Uh, yeah, I mean, you have to, to be able to show something which is optimistic, you have to have a little pessimism in there somewhere to be able to, to show how kind of bright something can be. It's like if you have white, if you just have white, a piece of white paper here and you look, it's white, you need another piece of white paper that's even brighter to show you know, how white it actually is. So I think that sometimes the interiors can be dark, like the balloon dog. You know, uh, there's a darkness on the inside, and through because of the transparent coloring that's there, and you look through the coloring into the steel. That uh, the deeper you go, the darker it gets. But not ugly. Uh, you know, I I don't. Uh, I mean, I don't think that it's ugly. I think that uh, there are moments where you see into the darker side of things, that you feel certain tensions, and that. Uh, you know, you understand that there are different forks in the road. You know? Have you ever thought of making a movie? I did, and uh, I'm glad that I didn't, though. You know, Which one? Uh, uh, Made in Heaven. Oh, yeah. that was a movie? Well, it wasn't a movie, but I thought about making a movie. Oh, but you didn't. Oh, yeah. Uh, I did. Oh, you've done the porn movie, right? Yeah, that would yeah, have well, been great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I would have been but, for that. You know. But, yeah. you know. I made the billboard for it, and uh, I remember that. Yeah, I made yeah. the billboard for it, but I knew, you know, I was listening to myself. I wish I would have listened even closer intuitively, but I really didn't want to do it. I didn't want to make the film, and I've always felt that I have enough on my plate just dealing with the mediums of, uh, you know, the two-dimensional realm of painting and three-dimensional sculpture right now. That this is an area that I have a, a, enough. So you're with. not gonna, you're not thinking of not making a porn movie, but to go back to make any kind, even video art. Well, um, I, c I couldn't say that. I mean, maybe there would be uh, an opportunity sometime where something would seem to uh, be correct. You know, that could be interesting. But so tell us a little bit of. I haven't seen yet. Big Heart, you just did the yeah. one, uh, the giant heart. Well, I made that. That was part of the uh, celebration work. Well, it was, but yeah. hasn't it just been installed? Uh, that piece came from my uh, own collection, but one was installed at Crystal Bridges. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that uh, is part of uh, uh, the celebration series. I was walking down, I think, Lexington Avenue, and I saw this plastic heart with the so gold ribbon just in uh, this pharmacy. And I went in. I said, "I'll give you five dollars for that heart," mm -hmm. and they sold it to me. And I went back, I photographed it for this calendar, and uh, you know, that's the hanging heart. Do you feel pressure, I mean, you know, to top yourself, to keep going, what's next, what's next, what's next? Isn't that pressure? No. It's not? No, no. Because uh, uh, for me, it's about exercising freedom. It's about that opportunity. And uh, so, I mean, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to experience the vastness. You know, I would like, I always think about uh, kind of the moment of death that, you know, uh, maybe right at that moment there's a sense of consciousness of just how easy and everything would be made so clear and that everything would uh, present itself uh, was just there. And, you know, I don't want that moment that, you know, all of a sudden I'd be, oh, if I only would have done that, oh, it would have been so easy. I could have made the most incredible thing. And, uh, but I want to experience that today, not at that moment of death, of, uh, uh, if a uh, moment of enlightenment would happen like that. And, uh, and I've thought a lot about the artistic process of what one does. And I really believe the only thing that you can do is uh, trust in yourself, follow your interests, and focus on those interests. And if you do, it takes you to a very metaphysical place. Do you believe there's death in your work, in the work that we've seen all tonight on these slides? Is that referenced? Uh, I mean, they're all dead. You yeah. know, uh, I mean, life is only you know, a biological uh, thing that happens inside us. The art happens inside us. Uh, they're dead. The only exciting thing 
that uh, to me is to try to experience uh, uh, an enlightenment, uh, to get a greater understanding of the potential and to live that potential. And how do you, do you read your reviews still, or ever? Uh, you know, I will look at things that are in, in print in a small way, but I, I don't read uh, essays or anything like that. But when it started, did bad reviews help? They made my career. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, I was always disappointed. I would think, you know, they don't understand. I remember somebody writing that my work was immoral, and they were writing about the aqualung and lifeboat, and I thought, these are all symbols uh, to me in the Equilibrium show about uh, kind of morality, and I was kind of saying uh, that, you know, the art world is, is kind of not being moral, you know, and that's about going for it. Uh, but what did they mean? Because the, the lifeboat would have sunk. I, I, well, yeah, the lifeboat would have gone down. But no, but they just, they were just responding to kind of immoral. The same thing still happens a, a lot in uh, the way people respond to things. But uh, 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 no, it doesn't bother me. You develop kind of a Teflon coating. And maybe for a moment, something will bother me. But within a day, it's kind of like it never happened. I always said to read the good ones twice, the bad ones once, and put them all away and never look at them again is the best. Yeah. Well, I think we're, with our time limit now, what we'd like to do, people have been tweeting and sending in questions from the audience all night. So we're going to look here and see what questions people have from you. Wow, okay. What is greater, truthful work or giving the audience what they want, or are they equal? Uh, what is greater? I mean, I would uh, Would you like me to repeat that. Yeah, well, I think I, I think I kind of understand okay. it. But it would mean, you know, what uh, a truthful work would mean. I mean, I would interpret that to be uh, the greater, in that you know you're just making a work. If if somebody will present me with an opportunity, and this happens a lot with charities, uh, oh, you know, we, we would like you to make something, and you want to do it for the charity. But uh, you know, here's a shoe. Make a piece of art out of it. Uh, that's not the foundation of art, that's design. And the only thing I can kind of do is probably end up with a design object here. Where art is something that has absolutely no, nothing's connected to it, there's no demand from the beginning, it's just anything you want to do. So, uh, you know, that's what I'm trying to do, is just what I want to do. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to say that I, I can live in a trailer and I can buy all the beer I want, and I can do what I want to do the rest of my life. So I'm, I think I'm doing what I want to do. I think you've reached, I always said success was two things. You could buy every book you wanted without looking at the price, and you never have to be around assholes. <laughs> and you've yeah. reached that. Yeah. We've both reached yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Why is it important to make art free to the public? That's, and maybe he doesn't think that's the right answer no, either. No, no, no. Yeah. No, it's great. No, it, you know. Art's always uh, fantastic, and uh, the reason it's important is we all, you know, benefit from uh, experiencing uh, transcendence. And I think as soon as anybody learns to kind of take care of themselves and able to be self-sufficient, automatically they want to do that for the community. And uh, so I think every individual, I think this is throughout history, that people want to kind of in better their, uh, their situation, they want to experience, and then automatically you want to share that. And art is in that dialogue. Everybody in the art world, uh, the reason they're there uh, is they first of all appreciate the community, they appreciate each other, and they appreciate uh, you know, the experience they have from art and sharing that kind of interest and uh, that transcendence with each other. But Jeffs, don't you sometime enjoy the elitism of the art world? I do. Uh, I think art for the people is a terrible idea. You know, I think... Uh, I mean, everything has its place. I mean, that's one of the reasons, like, I am, like the Made in Heaven work. When I made Made in Heaven, you know, uh, today the world's changed a lot. I mean, uh, it's nothing. You can pick up a pop album and uh, the language is very strong or images are very strong. But, you know, I, everything has its place and there are different audiences for everything. And uh, so I, if somebody can absorb something and they have interest in it, it it's fantastic. I mean, I don't, I don't see any separations. It's all about 
you know, going, if, you, if something grabs your interest, you go with it. If it doesn't, you just you look somewhere else. You know? But you don't get angry at the very unsophisticated, oh, my kid could do that. Well, your kid couldn't do that, but your, mm-hmm. their kid could like that, which mm-hmm. is radical. Mm-hmm. Really, to say that your child could like art is, yeah, is yeah. to some artists, would make them nervous. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I'm very happy that maybe their children would have interest in the work. And yeah. uh, uh, so, no, those, that type of dialogue uh, doesn't bother me. I guess I'm kind of looking, John, a little bit at a big picture, because I really would like to have a dialogue, and I'd still like to do something. I still feel like I haven't done something yet, and I'd like to do something. All right. For Jeff and John, are there any writers or literary figures that inspire you? Uh, which figures? These literary, uh, li- literary figures yeah. that inspire you? Uh, well, philosophically, I mean, I, I like Plato, you know, mm-hmm. and I've always enjoyed Kierkegaard. Um, in contemporary time, I mean, I enjoy uh, reading about science. I like Steven Pinker, you know, it's, uh, but... Uh, that's what Not for your art. It didn't really end up in your artwork. Yet. No, I mean, these yeah. things do. I mean, when I, I read uh, usually uh, any body of work, if there's something I'm involved with and uh, really kind of focusing on it, it stimulates you and you end up incorporating aspects of it uh, into your work. I think to answer the person's question, I think Denton Welsh and Jane Bowles were the two that mm-hmm. I loved the most that were novelists. Mm-hmm. What's your opinion of the booming art market and skyrocketing prices? Mm-hmm. Well, I bet you've never had that question. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'd have to say that uh, it was something that I never anticipated as, as an artist. I got involved with art, you know, never anticipating uh, whether I could make a living doing this or not. Again, I just wanted to participate. And I always would have been happy, again, as I mentioned, of just uh, being able to have the freedom just to live my life and to follow my interests the way I wanted to. I think that uh, art is touching a lot of people because there's so many different uh, uh, opportunities of, uh, uh, through technology and access. Uh, you know, people say, oh, art's uh, you know, removed from the people, you, it's so expensive, nobody can uh, have art. I mean, people have more art than ever. We have the internet. I mean, I, I, I just before coming to this talk, I was looking at Picasso's work. I was going to different museums on the internet. I mean, you can print things out. You, there's so many images. And so we have more connection with art than ever and can experience art without travel and do all of these things. So we're closer to art than ever. You know? And what would Divine have to say about Jeff Koons? Well, <laughs> he would be mad that you did Lady Gaga's album and not his. <laughs> Uh, let me see when those are easy. When did you each encounter each other's work? I, I think the first show that I saw of yours was the vacuum cleaners, mm-hmm. and and the new show. And where was that? Was in Soho? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. First That's time first was probably time. Artist Space. That's where I saw it. Yeah. yeah. And you probably maybe saw the movies in Baltimore. Pink Flamingos. Yeah. 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 And it was fantastic. Yeah, Why do people go to museums? <laughs> I don't know if that's a snotty question or not. <laughs> For the lunchroom? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what I think is really wonderful about a museum is a sense of human history. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like going to a natural history museum. I have kind of the same type of sensations of learning about human history, of what it uh, feels like to be a human being and what's important to us as uh, human beings, and about our mortality, and how, uh, yes, you can live for a brief period of time and still have have a connection with human history that's both before you existed and after you're gone. Can you think of a time when you saw an artist's works influenced by yours, and were you pleased with the outcome? You know, I'm always honored if I see uh, anybody in any way making some type of uh, reference. I, but I you do see it. You feel sometimes like, well, they stole that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that I, they stole that. I, you know, I'll, may, I'll maybe say to my wife, oh, you know, honey, look, uh, this kind of reminds me a little bit of a gazing ball or uh, mm-hmm. somebody's referencing that. Or, uh, but, you know, that's, that's exciting because with my own work, I'm referencing so many different artists. And to me, it's like a family. It's like taking a, a thread and stringing popcorn on the thread, you know. Uh, it's, it's, 
All right, I think I'll close it because I think we've done our 15 minutes of questions. Is a, this is a very grand question. What major life events have influenced your work? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I'd have to birth. say... Birth. <laughs> yeah, birth, yeah. That's good. That's good. Yes. Uh, I, John, I would have to say for myself, seeing the Jim Nutt show in New York at the Whitney in 1974, and uh, Jim Nutt is a Chicago artist, Chicago imagist, and it was uh, a type of work that was very kind of subjective about kind of the self, and it was parallel pop art. Uh, the work was from uh, uh, the 60s, so parallel kind of New York pop. But it was a little more based in uh, Dada and surrealism. And yet, you know, Jim Nutt today, too, is a very objective artist. And you look at these pieces, which maybe on the surface seem like, oh, it's very subjective to Jim. And he's making references to Giotto and, uh, you know, uh, all different uh, uh, artists and uh, Picasso and so many different, uh, different references that are taking place. Good. So I'd say Jim Nutt. Well, Jeff, it's been an honor to have you here tonight oh, and to John, see you again. Been, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're, yeah.